This is a Faith Defenders audio presentation with author, lecturer, and Christian apologist, Dr. Bob Mori. Our Father and our God, we do thank you for the fact that we have not followed myth and legend. Our faith is not based upon fairy tales, mere gossip, stories told to entertain old women and little children. But our faith is built upon real history, real people, real situations, things that really, really happened just as they are described in Scripture. We pray that in this day and age in which our faith is under assault, Hollywood, the main media, delights at Christmas time of running articles ridiculing the nativity of our Lord. Then at Easter, they want to run articles ridiculing the resurrection. But Father, they ridicule what they know not because they don't know you nor the power of Christ's resurrection. During this holiday season, let us rejoice above and beyond the secular people. They're rejoicing because either they're getting gifts or they're giving them and they're thinking of the economy and the need to spend money and get going. And they, But we know the reason for the season is Jesus. Let us not lose sight of the incarnation of the Son of God in the midst of the celebration of his birth. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Turn with me to the only scientist in the New Testament who wrote one of the books to Dr. Luke. The Gospel according to Dr. Luke, he was a medical man, he was a scientist, he was trained in the hard sciences. Matter of fact, in his other book, the book of Acts, he makes the distinction in the Greek text between miracles in which people were healed through the supernatural power of God, through the Apostle Paul, and then how he healed people through the medical arts. Because there's nothing wrong with taking an aspirin if you have a headache. Some Christians think that somehow uh, to take any medication for either physical or mental problems is a defeat of faith. No, in the, in the Greek New Testament, in the book of Acts, Dr. Luke used the medical sciences in order to heal people. We must remember that Jesus said, they that are sick need a physician, need a doctor, dear. You see a Jewish doctor to come in. So the Bible does not condemn the medical arts, and it exalted it to the point that the only Gentile in the group was a medical doctor. You ever thought about that? Luke was a Gentile. What does he do in writing a Jewish Bible? And he was a doctor. Maybe that was in his favor. But a Gentile doctor was inspired of God to write a narrative of the gospel, the manifestation of God on the planet, and then the book of Acts. That's why you read in Luke chapter 1 and verse 1, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were what? What does it say? Eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses. You say, what does that mean? It means they witnessed the situation with their own eyes. They were all from Missouri. They saw it. And they were the servants of the word. It seemed fitting for me as well. Having investigated everything carefully from the beginning. Each of these words are very significant in the Greek text. Dr. Luke says, I didn't spare any effort in very carefully using all of the scientific knowledge and techniques that I have. I investigated this whole thing from the beginning. 
And having done so, I want to write it out for you in consecutive order. Most as excellent Theophilus in Scripture. Now, Theophilus is a literary We pray that in this day and age in which our faith is under assault, two words, they Hollywood, the main media delights at Christmas time of running articles, ridiculing the nativity of our Lord. Then at Easter, they want to run articles in a ridiculing the resurrection. But, Father, they ridicule what they know not because they don't know you nor the power of Christ's resurrection. During this holiday season, let us rejoice above and beyond the secular people. They're rejoicing because either they're getting gifts or they're giving them and they're thinking of the economy and the need to spend money and get going and they... But we know the reason for the season is Jesus. Let us not lose sight of the incarnation of the Son of God in the midst of the celebration of his birth. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Turn with me to the only scientist in the New Testament who wrote one of the books to Dr. Luke. The gospel according to Dr. Luke, he was a medical man, he was a scientist, he was trained in the hard sciences. Matter of fact, in his other book, the book of Acts, he makes the distinction in the Greek text between miracles in which people were healed through the supernatural power of God, through the apostle Paul, and then how he healed people through the medical arts. Because there's nothing wrong with taking an aspirin if you have a headache. Some Christians think that somehow uh, to take any medication for either physical or mental problems is a defeat of faith. No, in the, in the Greek New Testament, in the book of Acts, Dr. Luke used the medical sciences in order to heal people. We must remember that Jesus said, they that are sick need a physician. Need a doctor, do you? You see a Jewish doctor to come in. So the Bible does not condemn the medical arts, and it exalted it to the point that the only Gentile in the group was a medical doctor. You ever thought about that? Luke was a Gentile. What does he do in writing a Jewish Bible? And he was a doctor. Maybe that was in his favor. But a Gentile doctor was inspired of God to write a narrative of the gospel, the manifestation of God on the planet, and then the book of Acts. That's why you read in Luke chapter 1 and verse 1, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were what? What does it say? Eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses. You say, what does that mean? It means they witnessed the situation with their own eyes. They were all from Missouri. They saw it. And they were the servants of the word. It seemed fitting for me as well. Having investigated everything carefully from the beginning. Each of these words are very significant in the Greek text. Dr. Luke says, I didn't spare any effort in very carefully using all of the scientific knowledge and techniques that I have. I investigated this whole thing from the beginning. And having done so, I want to write it out for you in consecutive order. Most excellent Theophilus. Now, Theophilus is a literary device from two words, theos, theos for God and the word for love, and it meant a lover of God, and there really wasn't a guy running around by the name of Theo. At that time, in that culture, you could dedicate a book to an individual who was a literary figure, meaning 
Anyone who is a friend of God is what the literally means. This book is for you. Now, if you t- look over in the book of Acts, just keep your finger in, in Luke and turn over to Acts chapter 1. This is why Dr. Luke again picked up his pen. The first account I compose, Theophilus. See, there's Theo again. What was the first account? His gospel. Guess what the second account is? The Acts. What Christ did on earth and then what Christ did in heaven. You see, he did part one and part two. Now, there was no Theo running around. It's a literary technique meaning anyone who's a true friend of God will listen to what I have to say. Now, back to Luke. The way that he did this in a scientific manner was to interview people who were still alive who shared with him all kinds of biographical details that Matthew doesn't come up with, Mark doesn't come up with, and, of course, not John. But the, thir- the first three Gospels are called the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they are in sympathy, like you're going to the orchestra and it's a, sympath- a, a, a symphony, because they deal with what Christ did in Galilee as he ministered to the world. John is kept to the side because he deals with what Christ did in Judea, not Galilee, John deals with what Jesus said in private to his disciples, whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke deal with what Jesus taught to the public. That's why the first three Gospels are always put together, and John is put to the side. And Luke carefully interviewed people, and he came up with all kinds of details that nobody else had because he talked to them. He went and visited them. And the most important person he talked to was the mother of our Lord, Mary. He went and sat down. He said, now, Mary, start at the beginning. What happened? Well, this angel showed up and told me this and told me that. and I treasured in my heart and I was, well, how did you feel? I was afraid. I was confused. And and you got to know about my cousin Elizabeth. And, and you have three announcements of the birth of Messiah, one after the other. And it is the memory of Mary that is generating the details. You see, some of these people have died. If you remember back in the temple, you have the old woman and the old man, Anna, and stuff like this. They'd, they'd already died. And when we come to the story of the shepherd, in Luke chapter 2, verses 8, all the way through to verse 20, we have one of the most remarkable, astounding stories in all of God's Word. The first question we ask concerning the story of the shepherds who were abiding in the fields at that time where did he get the information? Now, some people, they somehow think the Bible came by voodoo-nomics, the twilight song. That is, Luke had a pen and a piece of paper, and he closed his eyes and, and did automatic writing. He didn't come up with names and details because there was music in the air, there was a seance going on. He went and asked people. And in this case, verse 19, scholars have pointed out, this too is one of the details. Mary treasured all of these things, pondering them in her heart. The whole story where the shepherds were and what happened and the angels and the coming and the going and the rushing and out here and over there. He said, where did Luke get that? He got it from Mary. And she says, you know, I remember it to this day because it was quite 
remarkable. Have any of you ever experienced something you know you will never forget? Yeah. Any of you who are married, hopefully you won't forget when you were married. <laughs> Neither will you forget when you have your first child and your second child. Neither will you forget the day of your salvation when Christ was pleased to save you. There are certain things you generally don't, you won't forget. The text in the Greek says, Mary was still thinking about the shepherd, pondering. Now that word pondering, she was chewing it over. The older you get, the more you think back to your kids and stuff like that. I see my son, 27, and then I see him immediately in my mind's eye as a baby with the diaper, and he did the inchworm crawl. You know, some kids crawl, some does inchworm, inchworm, all around. And I used to sing that as he inchwormed along the rock. How many of you remember what your children did? Of course, no matter how old you remember. And your grandchildren, those of you so blessed. Mary, where did the information come? Mary treasured these things. Up. Now look at that word, treasure. These memories were her treasures. I one time told my kids, you know why I spend money to take you on vacation and I send you to Christian camp? I'm paying for memories. I'm buying good memories for you. See, your memories are your treasures. They're your treasures. And you treasure your memories, and you should think about them and keep them with you. And even though Mary had to go through seeing her son murdered and then later resurrected, yes, but still a mother's heart. What did Scripture says? A sword will pierce your heart. Yeah, but she still liked to think of those good times about the birth of our Lord. So first of all, I want you to notice this comes from Mary. She treasured these memories. And to this day, Luke says, she's still thinking about it. So this isn't some wild story. Now, if you read the liberal theologians, Robert Gundry and other redaction critics who believe that this whole thing was a, a romantic novel and never really took place and uh, it had been barred from the Greco-Roman mystery religions and there were no shepherds, no star, no wise men. It was all a fraud. Thankfully, I got him thrown out and led the charge to do so. No, we're dealing with reality in terms of an outline that we will not finish today, as I said. In terms of you, those of you taking notes, number one, in terms of the shepherds, we will deal with their occupation. Secondly, manifestation, verses 9 through 14. Part three, Verification, verses, verses 15 through 16. Four, evangelization, verses 17 through 18. Five, vindication, verse 19. And finally, number six, glorification, verse 20. Let us now examine the story of the shepherd from the Greek text. First of all, it states in the same region, what region? Well, you simply have to read back. You have to go back a little bit to verse 4. Joseph went down from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. So we're talking about the vicinity of a city called Bethlehem. Now, how many of you have been to Israel? You've been to Bethlehem? Anybody here? And you went to the shepherd's field and you take the bus ride and even the Jewish tour. My wife and I took the Jewish tours. We didn't want the schlock from the Christian tours. Too much schlock. 
And he said, here is the shepherd's field with the shepherds, you know, supposedly had all of that. So you're talking about a pasture near the city of David to Bethlehem. And he states there were some shepherds, and these shepherds were living out in that field in a hut or in a tent, taking turns watching the sheep so that nobody stole them or nothing ate them. Now, first of all, shepherds. There are those who automatically assume, assume that shepherds refer to a very low-class, filthy, dirty, scummy kind of person. No. Too many people assume that if you're poor, this means you're wicked. Just because you do not have a lot of money does not mean that you are evil. Poverty does not mean wickedness. It does not mean criminality. Too often, uh, the humanistic idea, of course, is that those who resort to crime and violence do so because they don't have enough money. May I tell you, the biggest crooks in the world were rich people who were robbing other people. Just talk about the stock market. Poverty does not mean wickedness and criminality. Poverty does not make you do wicked things just because you're poor. I experienced in my childhood a great deal of poverty, having a father who gambled and was an alcoholic. There are times we had nothing to eat but flour balls boiled in water. No shoes to go to school. I know what it is. But I don't, well, we didn't resort to crimes. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you go out and rob someone and not knock them on the head. These shepherds, yes, in terms of their economic standards, were poor because this was like the bottom of the job ladder. You couldn't get much lower in terms of pay for the job of watching some, sh some sheep. Now think about that. How much would, not even minimum wage. And you see, the shepherds were poor. They were on the bottom rung of society. But in this case, these were shepherds who were pious as well as poor. They were believers in Yahweh. They were godly men who looked forward to the coming of Messiah, who expected the Messiah, who thought about it, who perhaps read about it, but who expected it. And when all of this went down, they didn't really show any doubt whatsoever that the Messiah existed. They didn't tell the angel, what Messiah? They said, where is he? We're going, we're going now. They were poor and pious believers, and they were at the bottom rung of the economic uh, type of society. And of all the shepherds who were hired to take care of sheep, these were the ones who got stuck with night shift. This is all in the Greek text. They had night shift. Now, that meant they took turns. The Greek word is they took turns watching the sheep all night. Someone had to stay on the alert because sheep were valuable and they were near the city and there were bad people who would come and get those sheep. If they think they could steal one, they'd steal it. So somebody had to be looking. I worked at various jobs as a ute, including that of a security man. I had to walk through a warehouse and put a key you know, they know the, the, the security men would go sleep on a cot. So uh, some of you work that, you know, that, that you had to get at a certain time and do a key to make sure you were walking around looking. These were poor but pious guys who ended up on night shift. How many of you have ever worked the 11 to 7 night shift? It's a bummer, man. Now, when I was young, it was okay. I could do three nights and, and go to the beach all day, you know, go three, four nights, with, days without sleep when you're young. Not now. So these shepherds who were, had night shift, 
They had a little hut. They had to stay awake. That's why they weren't asleep when all of this took place. Didn't you ever think about that? How come they were awake in the middle of the night? That was their job to be awake. Then you have to think about of the three announcements of the birth of Messiah, you had the whole thing with Elizabeth and Zacharias and the birth of John, then you have the announcement with Mary. This is the third one, the third one. The first two were with family. They were not family. They represented the common man in the street to remind all of us that Jesus came for us. He was born not just for his family, not just for his tribe, but he was born for us. So these shepherds were up. They were in the night shift. They perhaps had a little fire going through some twigs. The sheep and the lambs trusted them were all bedded down. And all of a sudden, verse 9 an angel of Yahweh suddenly stood before them. Just think of Star Trek and the angel suddenly materialized right in front of them and he stood. Very important, he stood. Throughout the Old Testament, when angels stood, that meant there was a human physique. Angels manifested themselves always as good-looking men so good-looking, the gays rioted at Sodom and wanted to rape them one in the It's a very difficult situation. But here, this guy materialized in front of them, and they knew this wasn't simply a man. He suddenly stood there in front of them. They knew from the Old Testament that God had appeared in human form, that angels had showed up to the patriarchs and the prophets, and the Old Testament was full of the appearance of these marvelous beings called the ambassadors of the Lord, the messengers. And you see, the word angel is not even a translation of the word. It's what we call an alliteration the A for the A, the N for the N. If they translated, it would say, and suddenly a messenger from Yahweh suddenly materialized in front of their very eyes and stood there, and they saw him, all of them, whoever was there amongst the group on the night shift, they all saw it together. Now, simultaneously, you must see the Greek in terms of the tenses of the verbs. You've got to set this. They're, night sh they're the night shift. They had the coffee or whatever. The fire was going. Everything was quiet. All of a sudden, this person appears and materializes. And around this person and around them, all of a sudden explodes the Shekinah glory of Yahweh shone all around them. It was as if a spotlight had been shown on them and everything was ablaze. Whoa. Now, you've got to realize in the ancient world, they didn't have the phenomena of all the lights that we have. I mean, New York City, you live there, you grow up there, you don't even know there are stars because the lights of the building, you'd look up, you'd never see them anyway. I'll never forget when I moved to Pennsylvania with and there, my family, we at times would go out, right, honey, and put a blanket just to stare because there were no street lamps. No, it was totally dark, and you could see thousands of stars. So there was complete darkness. They didn't have modern electricity. All they had was a little campfire. And all of a sudden, the whole thing just blazed with light. The Shekinah glory of God enveloped them, devoured them, all around them. 
And I don't know about you. Nobody has said anything at this moment. This being materializes right in front of them. All of a sudden, they're in a spotlight, and they were terribly frightened. See what it says at the Greek? It's much more dramatic. They were scared out of their wits. They were frightened beyond their ability to stand it. How many? I, they were terrified. They were terrified. Had it happened before to them? Had they been eating magic uh, mushrooms as Allegro? The liberal theologian suggested the shepherds had made a stew and had magic mushrooms, and this whole thing was an hallucination. Now, you don't have group hallucinations. If you're, even if you all take the same drug, one will see spiders, another will see this, that, and the other. Of course they were frightened. They didn't know whether or not they were going to be judged because they were conscious of their sin. They didn't know what was going to happen. Now notice very carefully, it does not say the angel of the Lord. Notice that carefully. Remember, you've got to notice the details. In the Old Testament, check my book on the Trinity, there's 65 pages on this. The messenger of Yahweh was the Son of God appearing in human form in what is called a theophany or a Christophany, where the Son of God appeared in human form to Noah, to Adam, to Abraham, etc. But there are also appearances of angels, some of them you know as Gabriel and other angels. Here, Luke very carefully says there was a messenger from Yahweh that materialized in front of them, and all of a sudden light burst out like they were in the middle of a spotlight. Not the angel of Yahweh. So notice very carefully, we're not even given the name. Uh, some of the early church fathers who loved to speculate, and that's, of course, where you get into trouble. Speculate means you guess. And they said, well, then it's probably the same dude that showed up to Mary, and it's Gabriel. And, but we're not told. We're not told. So if you're not told, I don't think we ought to play that game of speculate. Would you also notice why December 25th is not Christmas? Now, you must understand several things. Number one, the sheep were put out to pasture in the spring. They were never put out to pasture in the winter because there was nothing to eat in the winter. They would not be out in the cold. That's why, uh, traditionally, in terms of scholarship, the birth of our Lord was probably June 5th. June 5th. Well, where did we get this December 25th? Well, you've got to remember that the Roman Catholic Church, particularly during the reign of Constantine, and that would be from A.D. 306 to 337, wanted to substitute Christian things in the place of pagan things. Now, that's good. That's not wrong. The pagans already had a celebration on December 25th having to do with the planet Saturn, and they had festivals and the giving of gifts and all of this other stuff. And he, some, some Christian said, I got a good idea. Instead of fighting the pagan world and telling the Christians, no, you can't celebrate uh, Saturn. Why don't we just say, hey, we Christians are going to do our own thing. We're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Not that he was actually born on December 25th, but we will pick that day because it doesn't matter to us. It's that he was born, not when he was born. So we Christians can celebrate the birth of our Lord anytime we want, and we just happen to choose the same day that the pagans are out running around. And some of you know many of the traditions connected with Christmas, uh, the Yule log, the mistletoe, 
many, many things had their origin in these pagan things. Even uh, a wassailing and certain of the drinks and things of this nature. Now, this doesn't mean they were adopting the pagan understanding. It meant they were substituting something good in the place of something evil, which I don't have any problem with. But then this leads to stupidity, such as on YouTube. <laughs> and I just did a video refuting this group who's, who want to point out Jesus was never born because December 25th was a pagan celebration of the planet Saturn. And they assume that Christians really believe that Jesus was born in the winter on December 25th. And therefore, if they can connect it with the astrology, therefore they've refuted the existence of Jesus. Well, this is stupid, absolutely stupid. And what you have to understand, the sheep are in the pasture. This is in Joan. Uh, the roads in the region were impassable in the winter. Obviously, they rushed over to look, so there wasn't a problem. And then thirdly, December 25th was chosen as an opportunity to substitute a Christian festival in the place of a pagan one. So you've got to realize, don't think of snow. Don't think of Rudolph and the reindeer landing, and then they got in the sleigh and made their way over to Bethlehem. <laughs> you've got to get rid of the, the December thought in your mind. And it's too late, by the way, to change it. You can't change that. You say, well, we'll make Christmas June 5th. <laughs> yeah, sure. You're going to overcome a thousand years of Western Euro European thinking. Now, you've got to remember, the Eastern Orthodox do not have Christmas on December 25th. There are other Christian groups that don't choose. They have their own day. So around June, it's spring. There's good grass out there. The guys are out there. This angel suddenly appears. They're frightened to death. Now we come to verse 10. Thankfully, the first one to open his mouth was not the shepherd. Now that, to some commentators, proved there were no women shepherd, shepherds there. <laughs> they would have said something. The first one to say anything was this angel. But the angel said to them, I, they were terribly frightened, they were terrified, do not be afraid. Now, some of you may have a different translation because that's a pathetic translation of the Greek. The Greek says, do not go on being terrified. The Greek tense says, I know you are scared out of your wits. Don't continue to panic. The best way I would ex perhaps translate this myself, don't go on panicking. Stop panicking. Stop being afraid. Now, it's interesting, and you can study this on your own be it the birth of our Lord or his resurrection, always the first word is stop panicking. Because you know what God's people do? They're always panicking. <laughs> Obama was elected! Stop panicking! <laughs> Proposition 7! Stop panicking! We might end in depression! Stop panicking. God's people always get scared individually or in groups. <laughs> and then they have all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories. They give in to their fears. And again and again, whenever Jesus had to address people, whenever angels showed up, the first word is, stop panicking! Stop it! God is still on his throne. You have no reason to panic. He's meditating on that point. He says, stop panicking. I said, you know, people get to try to get you into a panic. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? It's all over. Chicken little. Sky is falling. Sky is falling. Sky is falling. Who cares if the sky falls? 
If you have Jesus, let it fall. Who cares if we go into depression? I told my wife, so we end up in that white trash trailer camp down in Alabama eating dog food. If that's what it takes to serve Jesus, hand me the Alpo. I'll put a little bit of garlic powder, a little bit of onion powder. I'll put it in, ooh, by the time I'm finished, the landlord of that white trash trailer camp will, what smells? I said, that's the Alpo. I fixed it up. You want some? Stop panicking. I wish God's people would take this to heart. Don't be afraid. And I did a little word study, and I got tempted to go off here in a tangent, but I, I pulled the horse back. What do, in the Bible, what did people get afraid about? Oh, the future and this and that. Always, don't, don't panic. Don't be afraid. Why? God is in control. Now, when he loses control, that's when you panic. <laughs> Push the panic button when God is not. Don't be. He says, for. Now, again, the pathetic Gentiles who translated this. It said, behold. Now, I've trained many of you by now. What is actually the word? Oy vey. Someone even got me a coffee cup that says oy vey. <laughs> oy vey. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is that the words great joy a good news are not in the Greek as a noun. See, some of you say, what is the news? Good news, that means gospel. Well, that's nice, but that ain't the Greek word here. There's one verb, one verb. I now evangelize you. That's what the Greek says. The angel said, don't be panicking because I am now going to evangelize you about a great joy. Not good news. The good news is part of the verb. I don't want you to panic because I'm going to evangelize you. Thus, the first preaching of the gospel, the first evangelism was right here in this passage, and it was done by an angel. He said, I'm going to evangelize you shepherds. I'm going to tell you something that you will automatically understand to be good news and it will produce mega joy, great joy. There's all sorts of interesting things that Dr. Luke, he loved making these compound words, two different Greek words and putting them together. He said, the angel said, I'm going to evangelize you guys and when I'm finished giving you the message of this evangelization, man, you're going to experience joy in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, in your spirit, and not just a little bit of joy. You're going to have mega joy, great joy, magnificent, great joy. So instead of fear, you're to have what? Joy. Instead of great fear, great joy because what God tells us should enable us to conquer our fears and to rejoice regardless of the circumstances that's why Paul could be in jail wasn't he writing the epistle to the epistle to uh, the Philippians he was sitting in jail and he said, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Well, what is the main word for rejoice? Joy. Joy. He says, rejoice. I want you to have an experience now where you experience not terror, but joy in your heart. Now, joy, many people rarely experience joy because they have nothing over which to rejoice. 
They're miserable, pickle-sucking people. Some people get it now and then. Christmas is coming, and I tell you, Christmas morning, when you see the kids dive under the tree with their little greedy hearts, what's mine? What's mine? Look at the boxes. That's yours. Where's mine? <laughs> These little greedy, grubby kids. Of course, they're in their 30s. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Still grubby. Greedy. Now, you can see how joyous a little kid is when a kid gets a toy they hinted the whole time. I wish I had. I remember forget that. My little pony. <laughs> no, was it Rainbow Bright? My daughter talked to not. She, you know, they had a hint. I think it was Rainbow Bright or My Little Pony, one of those things. So we told the aunts and we told this one what she wanted. She tore open the boxes. She was so happy. And I noticed the next day she'd throw in a corner and didn't play with it. But she did have joy. I had joy when I saw my children born, see them coming forth from the womb. I tell you, that's a great amount of joy. Those of you who haven't had kids yet, that's a joy. Getting married is a joy. Many wonderful things, but he said great joy instead of great terror. Now, he says, I'm going to evangelize you, and the result will be that you will experience great joy in your heart in the place of all this fear. And this joy, not the good news, this great joy is not just for you. Don't be selfish. God did it all for me, nobody else. We often fall into that in the negative when we have pity parties. Well, why did it happen to me? I lost my job. And as if God is running the universe just to see to it that you lost your job. <laughs> this is not just this great joy. I don't want just you. I want, as a matter of fact, all the people of God, the elect, to have the same experiences that I want you to have. I want you to experience joy, and I want them to. Now, notice carefully, he doesn't say all people. Period. Doesn't say that. All the people. Now, as you go back in the other two announcements of the birth, you will find that God was sending his son for his people. Think of Matthew. And you will call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. It's all the people of God. And that phrase, the people, tipped off most commentators, particularly the ones who look at the Greek. And here he's saying the ones who were pious and who, who were indeed the elect of God, the believers, they're going to experience great joy only if they ever hear about it. Shepherds, you see, they got to keep the whole thing to themselves. I just want to be a silent witness for Christ. <laughs> I'll let my life witness. So the shepherds, you see, they knew they had an obligation, didn't they? Did they experience joy in a cup? In a little while they will. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. And you will see that because they had been evangelized, verse 17, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And everyone who heard it wondered at the things which were told by the shepherds. Let me tell you something. If you ever experience great Joy, you cannot keep your mouth shut. If you're really a Christian, your problem is you're always opening your mouth and inserting your foot. 
Now, which type of Christian is more faithful to the Lord? Those who witness and share and tell about their experience or those who keep quiet? The angel evangelized the shepherds. Then the shepherds evangelized the ones they knew, their family, friends, and neighbors. They couldn't help but share. What an example they have for us. Just don't celebrate Christian or Christmas. Evangelize your family and friends because of Christmas. Now's your time to get in a few whacks. Said, boy, I love Christmas. They're the heathen relatives. It's a time to celebrate that Jesus came and he died on the cross so that we don't have to go to hell. Now they can snarl. Say, happy holiday. Well, happy Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. I'm saying Merry Christmas already. At Walmart, wherever I go. Merry Christmas. Oh, a happy holiday. No, no. Merry Christmas. I ain't taking Christ out of it. You can take Christ out of it all you want. If a business tells me they can't have Merry Christmas, then they're gonna go, they ain't going to be very merry because I ain't spending my money there. He says, yeah, this is going to be for all the people of God, the elect, those who've been waiting for Messiah. Remember, it's Luke who told us all this kind of stuff, you know, all this little detail, Zacharias and Elizabeth and how Mary visited and, Oh, look at all of this stuff. The Magnificat, Mary's song. Oh, my lands. All of these wonderful things that Luke records. Don't go on being terrified. Oy vey, I'm evangelizing you. You're going to have such great joy, and this joy is for all all the people of God, so you cannot keep your mouth shut. You have to share it. For today. <whistles> today. Well, it wasn't daytime. Okay, all right. It, it meant now. Right now. In the city of David, and we know from verse 4, that's Bethlehem. Why do we know that? Because the Messiah was predicted to be born in Bethlehem. You've got to remember, his birth had many prophecies connected with it. His death had 33 prophecies fulfilled in one day. His birth was filled with fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Today, tonight, in the middle of the night, in the city of David, you guys are pious. You know that's where the Messiah will come. There has been born for you. Now, in the Greek text, the sentence that you're looking at, the word born, is taken out of its normal word order and put almost at the very front of the sentence. So, well, that's weird. No, no, that was a technique. In order for the Greeks to communicate how to emphasize a word, they would take the word out of its normal order, take it, and put it toward the front of the sentence, sometimes the very first word. That's why the word is taken out, and it actually would say, today, born, born in the city of David. The emphasis is upon the fact someone has been born right now and the person who has been born is for you. For you. For your salvation, for your redemption, for your deliverance, for your eternal benefit. Everything you ever wanted from God to be adopted in his family, to become his child, to become an heir of all things, and to receive the resurrection of the body and the life forever. For you! Not f you got to understand, for you, you pious, believing guy, it doesn't matter how thick or how thin is your wallet, it only depends on how thick or thin is your soul. And these were believers. He said, you know, tonight, born in the city of David, for you. 
A what? Now, underline the word. What is it? How many other times is Jesus called Savior in the Synoptic Gospels? No other time. This is it. He said, now, wait a second. Everybody knows he's the Savior. Yeah, but you've got to remember each gospel writer had different things in mind. Matthew wanted to impress the Jews that Jesus was born he, he who is king. Ah, he was the king, you see. He is the ruler. But here, once from the very lips of the angel. The one who was born is not described as a political leader, the king, the ruler, the emperor, nor of some industrial giant, CEO, not a governor, not anyone of great significance, not a military leader, a general, a soldier, the one who has been born for your sake is a Savior. Now, in the Pauline epistles, that's when you have this whole expansion of the concept of Jesus our Savior. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you see, Matthew presented Jesus as the king. Mark emphasized that he was the servant of the Lord. And here in Luke, elsewhere, he's the son of God. But here, the angel said, he's a savior, comma, who is now Christos Curios, Christos Curios, not even Christos, Ho curios, or ho Christos, Christus curios, Messiah, Lord. And the commentators have pulled the hair out of their head. How do you, how do you translate this? Well, obviously, this Savior is the Messiah, no question about it. But you see, Jesus requires two explanations. The baby who was born in Bethlehem, you cock your head this way, he's the Messiah. Then you have to turn your head this way, he's more than a Messiah. He's man, he's God. Creature, creator. Impotent, omnipotent. Limited, omnipresent. This Savior has two natures, and the angel at the very inception of the gospel announces one explanation will not suffice for this person who was born. He is man of every man and God of every God. The word curios simply meant Yahweh, that ancient Jewish tetragrammy, Y-H-W-H. This Savior is the Jewish Messiah, but he is also God. He is also divine. Now, those scholars who know something about the pre-Christian Jewish literature point out the phrase, Christos Curios, does appear in a few of the apocalyptic works, and I checked it. And there it referred to God. Now, you find the same thing if you turn with me, and we're almost, we're finished, really. If you turn with me over to Romans, the book of Romans, I'll give you two examples of how Christ, Jesus is Christus Kai Curios, Christ and Lord. If you look in Romans 1, verse 4, he was declared to be the Son of God. But he's also, verse 3, the son of David. You see the two things, according to the flesh and according to the spirit. He has two natures, human and divine. Same thing in chapter 9 and verse 5. The Apostle Paul picked up on this. (coughs) 
Whose are the fathers from whom is the Messiah according to the flesh who is over all God blessed forever? Here the Messiah according to the flesh is one thing and according to the spirit he is God. The two natures of Christ was proclaimed by the angel when he first evangelized the shepherds. You see, this is why the birth of this Jewish baby meant something. Christus kai curios. He is indeed. Ho curios mu kai ho fehas mu. My Lord and my God. What profound truths came out of the mouth of this angel to a bunch of shepherds. And when we pick up our message, and we'll pick up from this point of what the angel said, this baby is the Messiah. That in and of itself would be shocking. But he's also Jehovah, Yahweh. And you guys are the first ones to know about him. God chose you. And then you must go and tell it on a mountain. Father, we do thank you for the wonderful story that Mary treasured these things in her heart. That Dr. Luke was faithful in his research to go and ask her and sit down with her and ask her what happened, what was next, and who went where, and this, and all the little details, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, she could remember with clarity, remarkable clarity, because she treasured these memories. They were precious to her. And we pray, Lord, that we will be evangelized by this message. And we will bow at the cradle and at the cross and at the crib. Jesus, born, crucified, buried, and coming again that we will say he is our Messiah and he is our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. This has been a Faith Defenders audio presentation. For more information on the Ministry of Faith Defenders, visit faithdefenders.com or call 1-800-41-TRUTH. That's 1-800-41 and the word truth.